Okay, welcome back to part two of the dialogue lecture. And um, when we were just talking, uh, we were talking about this kind of tradition in British figurative art with this kind of um, interest in sort of obsessive looking um, and not flinching um, and not being scared of the body. Um, and on how that kind of tradition is kind of starting with Francis Bacon, but really coming out of the influence of Giacometti also um, led to people like Lucian Freud and Jenny Seville and Frank Auerbach. And I really should have included uh, Jenny Seville. And there are others as well um, that I could have included. And uh, I love these two paintings of, uh, of Auerbach, and, but I even could have included more. And Auerbach then leads to another artist who was heavily influenced by Auerbach, Glenn Brown. Although Glenn Brown's aesthetic uh, today may seem a little bit far removed, he actually began his career by making paintings that were exact reproductions of Frank Auerbach paintings. Uh, and, and in a minute you'll see like the connection as to the way he painted it's here. Uh, two of these paintings, this one and this one, I believe both of them are from his uh, Rembrandt exhibition where we actually had, saw a video on that in one of the playlists. And so in the beginning of his career, he, he would do these things where he would take famous Frank Auerbach paintings and he would make these highly realistic painted reproductions of them um, where the Frank Auerbach paintings are very very physical, right? The, the paint is very thick um, and it actually lifts off the surface, whereas Glenn Brown's paintings are actually very flat. They're, they're as flat as a photograph is, but he, with these tiny little brushes, he makes these reproductions of these big gushy paint strokes so that they actually look thicker. They look at, like a Frank Auerbach painting, but even gushier than a Frank Auerbach painting. Um, so like here's one example. Uh, and it, yes, uh, I love Glenn Brown's work. Uh, here's another place to start. Uh, Gary Hume, who is um, also a British painter. Uh, don't worry, we will get to some, some others uh, beyond the Brits. And his paintings um, have this very kind of flat quality where they're like this kind of poured paint sort of quality with this really stiff edges between the different color shapes. Um, and he has kind of like just certain sets of, of imagery he likes to look at where it's looking for kind of these almost abstracted forms. He loves these types of paintings that are just halfway between being recognizable imagery and, and not, um, or between two different possibilities of recognizable imagery. And his, his work, I feel, is highly influential on someone like Brian Alfred, but also you can definitely see an influence coming from someone like Ellsworth Kelly. Here's some more of Brian Alfred's paintings. Um, I really like the skateboard piece. And, and you can see that that same idea of the painting, the each area of paint having like a really, really sharp kind of almost lifted edge between them, how that's kind of part of this aesthetic that create, makes the paintings almost feel as much like a collage as anything else. And both, you know, Brian Alfred and, and Gary Hume are kind of part of this tradition of artists who definitely are influenced by someone like Alex Katz, uh, but probably the contemporary artist who's most influenced by Alex Katz would be um, Elizabeth Payton. All right, we're gonna start another kind of trend. Um, let's start with um, Andrew Grassi, who's a Scottish artist. And he began his career with this painting, where it was a painting of his working studio. And he did it in tempera. And it's this very, very meticulous, um, small little painting on board. And this idea of like very, very um, um, accurately with you know use of photo um, resources reproducing these spaces became an idea of his and the more and more he made them the more they became commentary on the art world so a lot of his paintings are images of museums and they become kind of like a discussion and a lot of them are also images of museums in the process of hanging shows so a piece like this and it becomes as much a work of art itself but also a discussion about the art world and a discussion about the art process. I really love this one of like the, the behind the scenes 
in a, in a permanent collection. Of, I don't know which museum that is. And so another artist who also makes work where it's very much, instead of uh, imagery about museums and museum space and the exhibit, you know, exhibiting of artwork, he makes artwork about the studio. And he takes, he makes photographs of artist studios, but not directly of their artist studios. He makes um, small little sculptures of the artists and of their studios and then photographs that. So um, I think, I can't remember which artist um, that is. I used to know which the image that was. There's a Chuck Close right there. So he's working on the Chuck Close, Close studio right there. And there's Chuck Close sitting in his studio. Um, only it's a miniature, of course. Who is that? It's going to come to me. And that led me to another artist, um, Mike Levitt, who makes um, art toys. Uh, and there's a whole world of these kind of like people who make uh, toys for small editions where they're basically designed for the collector's market. And he specifically makes art toys that are about contemporary artists. So he has this whole series that are, each one is a, a portrait of a different contemporary artist. So we have, you know, um, a Mark Hami Takashi and uh, Jeff Koons and Damien Hurst and Julian Schnabel. That's who was in the first one. I think that's, I think that is Julian Schnabel, only a younger one. Um, or maybe not. Who was that other? Anyway, Julian Schnabel is definitely there. Um, and Matthew Barney. And so that leads us to the last artist I'm going to talk about, Matthew Barney. Uh, by the end of this class, you guys probably seen a couple of Matthew Barney shorts, not not any of the long films. And you may not be aware, though, that Matthew Barney also makes physical sculptures as well. As what well, you know, he does performance pieces and he does kind of film, movie, video installation type work. But he also does make um, actual physical sculptures. And the thing about his work is that it you can also understand it as being part of a context. You can definitely see, um, and I think one of the ways to do that is to look at this particular piece, Drawing Restraint, where he um, made a film about him drawing in a space where he was literally in a harness that limited his body movement and kind of like suspended him from the ceiling and made it really difficult for him to draw on the wall because he was constantly being pulled away from the wall. And so then the restraint on him then defined what kind of drawing he could make. And that work was very much influenced out of this piece by Bruce Nauman, where he did a dance kind of performance piece where he um, danced a perfect square over and over again and drew a square with his body. And you can definitely see um, Matthew Barney's work as being coming out of an influence of uh, people like Eva Hess and Bruce Nauman and and also uh, Joseph Boys, like with the obsession with with um, wax and felt, and so I think that's where we're going to end. I think that is the last image. All right, I thought we were going to get to three parts, but we are we're going to end at two parts. All right, thank you very much. That's the end.